balls are fabulous. From the second they're born, these delightful fillies and colts are full of life and energy. Within minutes, they're suckling from mother. And within a day, they're running with the herd. They're remarkable creatures from the outset, growing so rapidly that within two years, they'll be close to full adult size. Ahead, we'll look at the amazing range of horse breeds. From the mighty Arabians and Halflingers, to the enormous Clydesdales and tiny miniature ponies. We'll check out all their classic signs and signals and watch them grow into feisty weanlings. From rodeos and races to the roundup. From polo tournaments and stylish Spanish festivals. We'll follow the modern horse through a range of uses and we'll check out their stunning public performances. From the Russian Cossacks and the master horsemen of Andalusia to the most developed and sophisticated form of dressage in the world the white Lipizzana stallions from the Spanish Riding School of Vienna, performing for the first time ever in front of Austria's stunning Imperial Schönbrunn Palace. All this and more as we saddle up and ride into the world of fabulous foals. witness a million dollar miracle. This is Australia's premier stud, Arrowfield in the Upper Hunter Valley, where the paddocks are full of almost a thousand heavily pregnant mares. For the past 11 months, the bellies of these thoroughbred brood mares have swelled as they prepare to give birth to a future generation of racehorses. It's two in the morning. The paddock has been floodlit and one of the mares is about to give birth. A sack is emerging from her rear and as she settles to the ground, the fall begins to present itself. First out, the forelegs. Then the head. Within 20 seconds, the entire body has emerged. It's a superb specimen, a healthy colt that already weighs half as much as an average sized man. These are precious moments. Mother's first bonding licks to clean and warm her newborn offspring. <laughs> The colt's first call. And then its first tentative shaky steps, where staying upright is a real challenge. Once it's mastered the art of standing upright, the colt's instinct is to nuzzle its mother, the first milk it receives essential to its well-being. By the time the sun has risen, the colt's legs have strengthened so quickly he can now spring to attention. 
No way he could do this only a few hours ago. He's starting to run too. Short bursts at first, then sprints that are longer and longer as the hours tick by. He's incredibly inquisitive as well, licking anything that takes his fancy. Humble tastes for a foal who's already valued at several hundred thousand dollars. To watch a herd of horses running as one is to take a trip back in history. Because this is exactly how horses survived. Living as herd animals to protect their newborn foals from predators. What you're watching run today is a herd of Arabian horses. Amongst them, five foals born in the past two months. These Arabians are renowned for their beauty and stamina, the result of thousands of years of careful breeding. And how's this? One of these foals, born here at Australia's Simeon Park, has been sold to an Arab sheikh. In all, there are more than a hundred breeds of horses, all with very distinctive appearances, like the Halflinger. You can pick them by that adorable Palomino colouring and flaxen mane and tail. And you certainly wouldn't have any trouble identifying the Appaloosa, the famous spotted horse. But it's the superb way this filly holds itself that sets it apart. This is a Welsh cob section D with a delightful gait and a high spirit. All of the foals we've seen so far are classified as light horses, meaning they can be ridden. Heavy horses, on the other hand, are the workers, the huge draft horses with the backbone of the world's economy only a hundred years ago. This Clydesdale colt already weighed more than an average sized man at birth. And by the time he reaches full size, he'll be as heavy as 12 men. But even at this age, three weeks, you have to agree he's still incredibly cute. This miniature pony has the characteristics of all pony breeds, small, tough, and hardy, qualities that developed as they evolved in the cold northern extremes of Europe and Asia. This beautiful colt is only a week old and will become some lucky child's pet. Horses are notoriously highly strung and nervous, which is why they were the last animal to be successfully domesticated. What's more, their senses are far more developed than ours. Their sense of touch, for instance, is used as a means of communication. Mutual grooming like this allows the horses to bond. When it comes to sniffing out their surroundings, they have an acute sense of smell. Watch this foal's upper lip curl back, an action known as flemming as it reacts to a strong smell. Then there are the ears. Laid back hard indicates displeasure. Pricked firmly forward shows they're really interested in something and twitching ears means the horse is paying attention. As for their instincts, well, they're deeply ingrained, while their communication is highly sophisticated. 
mothers will nip their youngsters if they're getting annoyed. Foals will roll vigorously on their backs to scratch and itch. And tails will swish if they're impatient or irritated. Even their tongues deliver a message, with this foal showing his thinking. And after all that bucking and swishing and scratching, they demonstrate yet another skill we've yet to perfect. The ability to lapse into a deep sleep while standing upright. so quickly. This energetic thoroughbred is now six months old and while it now runs exuberantly with the herd, it's already been weaned from its mother's milk. What you're watching here are future racing champions being reared at a unique British organisation known as the National Stud. We peddle dreams and some of those dreams are good and some are bad. Um, probably some of the best dreams that we've had come true in the sale ring would be 140,000 for a, a yearling and I think 940,000 guineas that is for a, a mare. Miles Littlewart is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Stud, a government owned operation that is the showcase for the British racing industry. Well, it's an operation that uh, is a commercial breeding operation, uh, looking after everything from conception to maturity of the thoroughbred. And we have stallions, and we have mares, foals, yearlings, we have the whole lot. Uh, we also have students from all over the world that we then teach um, the next generation of stud manager. Miles certainly knows his horses. He speaks graphically about the term confirmation and what that means in selecting a potential winner. First and foremost, you've got the skeleton, the legs, which will transmit the power. And the power is going to come from the quarters, the big muscle here, which drives the, the, the animal forward. And the front wheels, the shoulder and the forearm, which transmits the, the forward motion down through the forelimbs, through the fetlock, down to the hoof. And behind all that, in here, you've got the engine, the heart, the lungs, and also the fuel injection, the carburetor. Through the nostrils, that's how the air gets into the lungs and, and works to produce the energy which goes around the bloodstream and allows the animal to, to continue its forward motion. Later in the program, we'll come back to the thoroughbreds as they prepare to race. Horses, as we're about to see, have long enjoyed a close relationship with man. In this famous show, Spirit of the Horse, the world's most talented riders and horses have been brought together under the big top. It all begins with show director Nikki Fawcett on her elegant winged horse. It's very, very important with, with any horse, but especially with Arabians, to spend a lot of time with them. There's a lot of one-to-one, -one, there's a lot of understanding there, because with the act that I do, it's all voice training. Nikki is one of the world's leading presenters of the equestrian Sam, discipline yep. known as Arabian Sam, Stallions yep. at Sam, Liberty. Ali, her days are spent Sam. in countless hours oh, training her beautiful. horse, Samson. He works in an act called Freestyle Liberty, which is him and seven other pure Arabians work together just like this, completely loose. There's no reins, there's no saddle, there's no riders. And these stallions just beautifully run around me, rear up, waltz, change direction, do a lot of lateral work. Getting them all to stand upright is impressive enough, but the real skill is then getting them to walk backwards. 
So you have to give them lots of exercise, lots of time, lots of patience. It's not a horse you can work with in a short time. It's a horse that you need to put a lot of hours in with them. And they're a very one-to-one -one horse. So when you get that one-to-one -one with them, it's lovely. They'll do anything for you. Demanding perfect balance and complete cooperation from the horse. Another skillfully choreographed routine involves Spain's finest Andalusian horses and riders. Their long poles, known as garroches, were traditionally used to round up cattle. But look at how these riders and horses have perfected their work with the garrocha, manoeuvring in perfect harmony. Add to that mix a pretty flamenco dancing senorita, and the performance moves up a notch. is months of training and a very well-disciplined stallion. For a change of pace, the show features Texas Ollie and his clown horse called Silver. <laughs> Silver's uh, six years old now. I bought him when he was two and a half. He was a crazy horse. Nobody really wanted him. They couldn't handle him. So I started to train Silver and it wasn't easy. Don't be talking back, Mr. Ed. Let's see Mr. Ed. Do Mr. Ed, come on, hey. My me. training me. is all hey, natural. Hey, hey, it's all natural. It's time spent with silver, and you just come up with things. You study your horse. You okay. see your horse doing things, so you pick up on it. Give me a kiss. Oh, that's nice. Need for that. Lie down. Come on. Just down. getting silver to lie down on top of him down. took down. a year. All the, all the way. Okay, I just put him on my knee. Okay, silver, come dad's knee. Hey, hey. That's neat. There you go. It's pretty hard. It's it's dedication. You got it. Got to be dedicated once you start, and you got to love the horse. You really got to love it. In the show ring, all that love and dedication pays off. The finale of this Spirit of the Horse performance is an exhibition of the most extraordinary horsemanship you'll ever see. These Cossack riders from Russia are displaying skills developed over hundreds of years and used in battle. The idea was to confuse the enemy, like hiding on the blind side of the horse. Another tactic was their ability to be able to mount and dismount quickly. And above all, surprise their enemy. Their repertoire of cunning tactics includes the ability to ride upside down. It's a breathtaking performance, one that is in great demand in their homeland. And it's capped off by this. The rider dragged upside down along the ground. As a tactic, it was brilliant. Allowing the rider to appear dead or injured as he rode into the heart of the enemy camp to stage his attack. Horses were primarily used for work. These days, they're overwhelmingly used for recreation. 
Whether it be a Sunday morning hunt club in full stride, or a group of tourists on a far more leisurely amble, it's clear that the modern horse has the perfect body and temperament to give riding pleasure. Good west coast of Wales, horses are allowed on certain beaches. Riding horses, Welsh beach, oh, I think it's the magic, um, the exhilaration and that canter through the surf, the spray up in the face, it's wonderful. Everyone loves it. We see it on films. Here's the one chance where you can really experience it. John Owen organises hundreds of riders each year to experience the thrill of riding these Irish cobs through the surf and many are happy to get soaked. I think the horse, you can get back to nature. It's relating with something different, something that's not man-made. For many, racing along a sandy beach is a horse-riding dream. For others, the thrill comes from racing a horse. Further inland in Wales, at Lanortit Wells, they stage an annual event where runners try to beat a horse over a 35-kilometre course. Training for that gruelling race today is 17-year-old Hannah Lester. It's pretty difficult. Like, the terrain's not too good and, you know, diff it's difficult. You see these horses going off in the distance and you think, oh, am I ever going to get past it? There's a £25,000 reward for anyone who beats the horses. And hard as it is to believe, They've come very close. Although a runner hasn't been the first horse yet, he's been within a, a one and a half minutes of beating a horse on one occasion, four minutes on another occasion. So it's not all plain sailing. Organiser Gordon Green concedes it's hard for both the two-legged and the four-legged races as they challenge at an altitude of around a thousand metres. It's not quite as easy as you would think because the countryside is very mountainous. There's a lot of um, ascending and descending. It's an exceptional event in every way, as rider Jackie Gilmore testifies. I've raced it 14 times, um, and each time's different. Depends on the ground, depends on the weather, depends how wet it is, how dry it is, because it's quite easy for a horse to go up, not so easy for a horse to come down over stony, rough ground. Down in Spain, horses feature in a wide range of pleasurable pursuits. Once a year, thousands are ridden in this week-long pilgrimage to the town of El Rocio. Elsewhere, teams of horses are put through competitions. Others are used on the tourist circuit in Seville. while the sturdier of the breed have become an integral part of the ritual of bullfighting. But no event in Spain evokes more passion than the annual horse show. In Andalusia, where horses are idolised, they stage what has been acknowledged as one of the largest and finest horse shows in the world, the Feria of Jerez. In a country of great equestrian tradition, Jerez is the horseman's horse show, a place where the finest gentry and senoritas show off their mounts. The big attraction of this stunning promenade are the superbly trained teams of horses and their ornately decorated carriages. Even the British royals are big supporters of horse-based sports. 
From his base in Windsor Castle, the Duke of Edinburgh has founded the Guards Polo Club. One big supporter and active player at their nearby club grounds is Prince Charles. Today, we're watching horses being prepared for the Duke of Wellington Trophy. Horses that need to be tough and agile and lightning fast over short distances. The special qualities of a, a polo pony are temperament, confirmation, speed and really courage. They need to have that combination to, to make the definitive polo pony. Oliver Ellis is manager of the Guards Polo Club. They're really a working horse. They're working all the time. They're being exercised a lot of the time. They're playing matches two or three days a week. It's hard work. Not only is polo one of the world's oldest and fastest games, it's also one of the most grueling. to score a goal is one of the team captains, Glenn Gilmore. Glenn points out he needs far more than one horse to get through the game. I've got um, six that I'm actually going to play today and they vary in um, heights, ages, the way they move, the way they stop and turn. As one horse tires, Glenn swaps him for another, then another. You really have to admire the way these polo ponies perform. One second they're galloping at top speed. Next they're brought to a sudden stop. Then they're off again at lightning pace. They're also called on to shoulder their opponents out of the way. Leading the opposition is Tommy Wilson. Like all polo ponies, his must have lightning reflexes and a high intelligence. She is very quick and agile and uh, you always seem to end up with the ball in her during the game. She's, she's very, she knows the game, she follows it, uh, but she never lets you down um, and gives her all 100% of the time. In all, horses and riders battle it out for up to an hour. A gruelling, exhilarating contest where the winner is rewarded with a trophy. Getting a horse to spin on the spot like this takes an accomplished horseman and a very disciplined horse. Both are in abundance here at Hawaii's Parker Ranch, the largest ranch in the USA today. These Hawaiians still follow Mexican traditions, using the same saddles, training techniques and roping skills. In the arena, the real action happens. This is called dally team roping. The header catches the calf by the head with a lasso, and the healer joins in to rope the calf by the feet. It's one of the most popular roping sports in America, and definitely a favourite on Parker Ranch. In Australia, horses are still widely used on the big cattle stations. Driving herds of cattle across the outback is still a familiar sight. With station hands acquiring great horse riding skills from so much time spent in the saddle. And where do they get to show off those skills? The rodeo. What we're following is the annual Gloucester Rodeo, with contestants from all over Australia and New Zealand competing. Contestants like 16-year-old Garrett Allen in the Brock Ride. to stay on the 
horse for at least eight seconds. Not only does he stay on for that time, for the first time ever, he wins his class. Oh, at the start, I was getting a bit nervous there, because I hurt myself not so long ago. But yeah, once I got on the horse and bared down, it was yeah, fun from there on in. Not every rider can hold on for eight seconds. <laughs> Ross Edwards gets concussed in his ride. You can't just hold on. No, it's you got to, you got timing, and you got to get it in a rhythm, and you've got to go with that, and. Yeah, you've got to do your job and be on your game, otherwise you don't get any second chance. If you make a wrong move, you're straight on the ground. Ryder Grant Elridge stays on tonight, although he hasn't always been so fortunate. Lead I've had, um, broke a vertebrae in my back 12 months ago and a broken wrist and a couple of stitches, that's about it. As for tonight's biggest challenger, Neil Matheson. Well, he's come all the way from New Zealand to ride. It is an adrenaline rush. You, um, you get a bit amped up for it, and when you, when you do a good ride, that's, sort of, that's the best feeling you get after a good ride. Neil's ride is judged outstanding. It's well known that horses have four traditional gaits, the walk, trot, canter and gallop. But over in Iceland, a horse imported by the Vikings has two specialised gaits, a four-beat step known as the tolt, where the horse appears to run as it walks, and a gait it uses at speed over short distances, known as the flying pace. The horse doesn't touch the ground between steps, with riders boasting that it appears to fly above the ground. The Icelanders are so determined to preserve this unique species, they've banned all horses from being brought into Iceland. In Europe, the fastest growing equestrian discipline is dressage. We're joining Belgium's champion rider, Jerome Devereux, at one of his training sessions. As Jerome explains, qualifying for the Olympics is so hard, it's taking years and years to train his horse, Paganini. So he's nine years and we started with him three years old. So on this level, uh, we had six years and we still need a few years. Paganini and Jerome will practice for several hours every day perfecting a series of steps. Weight is the most important and afterwards the legs. So we try to do as much as possible with the weight and as less as possible with the, with the legs. It should look like it goes on its own. It truly is an art form, combining precision and perfect timing as the horse changes steps mid-stride. These dressage horses are so skilled and sensitive, they're able to sense their riders' abilities and conditions and respond accordingly. Take this contest, the Olympic Games equivalent for riders with disabilities. Jan Roos from the Czech Republic is visually impaired. And yet his horse carries him around the dressage arena with superb grace and precision. It's the same for Bettina Eistel from Germany, a rider born without arms. Bettina's horse carries her perfectly through a series of tight formations. I ride him with a feeling and I have the, the reins in my mouth, the upper reins and the uh, second uh, pair of reins on my feet. As Bettina can testify, her horse senses her disadvantages 
and responds superbly. He's a very sensible horse and it's just a fun and joy <laughs> to ride him. So superbly that after years of hard training, she wins a silver medal. As we've already seen, thoroughbred racing horses can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when one of them breaks through a fence and falls almost six metres down a cliff, there's plenty of room for concern. This one. What do you want? Yeah, do you? Emergency workers are called. So too is a crane and a vet. You can't sedate a horse heavily enough that it'll tolerate being swung around on the end of a crane. They just go berserk and he would have tried to sort of jump out of the sky. With the horse heavily sedated, it's harnessed and lifted way up onto the back of a rescue truck. Keep him off the wall, guys. He's coming up quicker now. He was out like a light when he went up that cliff, luckily. Otherwise, I think he wouldn't have liked it at all. Back on level ground, the horse quickly begins to recover from the effects of the short-term general anaesthetic. In Britain, the home of the horse racing industry is Newmarket. First light each day sees some 2,000 thoroughbreds and their jockeys out on a training ride. We're just about to exercise this filly. Um, she's an um, unraced two-year-old called Trinity Fair. And we're going to take her at the gallops this morning for some pre-exercise, getting her fit for her first, first debut. Samantha Wallen is a jockey who's very optimistic really, about she? the horse she's training. We've got a winner here. <laughs> We've got a live one here. Every day, Samantha and her fellow jockeys will warm up as many as four horses each. Like all modern thoroughbreds, the horses they're handling have been selectively bred over the past 300 years, with the British royal family once closely involved in their development, hence the term, the sport of kings. After a lengthy warm up, the thoroughbreds are given a hard run on a track known as the gallops. Their performances are clocked and evaluated, but with so much money being bet on the races, competition amongst breeders and trainers is hard. It is tough. Um, it's very tough to get started. Uh, you need a lot of capital outlay. You need a lot of luck. Mark Wallace is one of the new breed of trainers, caring for 40 racehorses in his woodland stables. His formula for training a winner? Well, they're athletes, you've got to work them hard, feed them right, and look after them. But they've got to be fit, they've got to be hard. For the horses that go through for a million quid, they usually turn out the best. You know, they're, they're, they are the blue buds, they're the, they're the best bred. After a hot and sweaty run, Mark's races are given a cooling swim. This purpose-built pool allows them to exercise yet again by swimming with three laps the norm. And after all that attention, it's into the stables where a battery of heaters ensures these million dollar investments are kept at just the right temperature. Race day is when all that breeding and hard training are put to the test. Today, we're joining the summer crowd at Britain's famous Sandown Park. Behind the scenes, race horses are floated in from all over the country, including the Newmarket stables. The horse we're following is Silver Line, a four-year-old gelding. Both owner and trainer are confident of a good place today. He's a gentle animal. He's uh, very good looking. Um, he 
He's uh, very game and genuine. He's uh, a horse you can get in the box with and, and pat. He's a very nice horse to train and that. And I mean, he's very good, if you know. I mean, and this is a nice handicap. Trackside, betting is a central element of the sport. The bookies are raking in the bets for race number four, with a silver lining at eight to one. Down on the flat, they're getting ready to race. Barrier gates opened, and they're off. Ahead of them, a run of one and a quarter miles. This is what these thoroughbreds have been bred for, racing. And it's at full stretch their racing physique comes into its own. True to form, it's Al Gilding's silver line that takes the lead in the home straight. And silver line it is. Fantastic, absolutely great. Um, over the moon, as they say in English football. For jockey Ted Durkin, it was a great ride. Lovely horse, he won last week actually as well for us, so it rained last night, so the rain probably helped him. And, and the race went like as planned. We had planned to go out there to be up, up right up behind the leaders and uh, everything went to plan. For the multi-million dollar racing industry, it's yet another victory for a breed of horse that's developed phenomenally since it was first introduced less than three centuries ago. By far the most developed and sophisticated form of dressage is performed by Lipizzana Stallions. One prominent showcase for these performances is at Jerez in Spain. So highly regarded are the movements performed here, the organisers refuse to call it a horse show. To them, it's pure art, or, to use its official title, the Royal Andalusian School of Equestrian Art. The movements are based on classical dressage. So sophisticated are some acts, they've taken years to perfect. The capriole is considered very difficult. And yet, this horse performs it carrying his rider. The most famous breeding stud for these remarkable white lipizzanas is in the hills of Piba in Austria. Europe's finest Lipizzanas are bred here. Horses that are agile and athletic and quiet, making them ideal for the disciplines of advanced dressage. We have the, the Spanish riding school for over 425 years, continuously working in Vienna. For the last 80 years, the Spanish riding school of Vienna has been conducted from here in Piba, after being taken over by the Austrian government. Stallions, like this beauty, Sigla V Europa, are raised and trained here. Sigla V is one of Piba's most talented graduates. And even though he's now retired at the human equivalent of 90 years old, he's still in remarkably good form. Next door in the stables are this year's new crop. A dozen mares, all with foals now three months old. So rigorous are the demands of the Spanish riding school that of these, only six will be selected to be trained and of those, only two will graduate. In the training arena, the mares go for a spirited run, showing off their powerful quarters, a 
quality that makes them ideally suited for the disciplines of the Spanish school. The mares are also ideal carriage horses. When the pizarras were used, the horses were used in Vienna to pull the carriages of the monarchy. Twice a day, the mares and foals of Piba are released from their stables and led to the paddocks, the opening sequence of a development program that will take years for the successful graduates to complete. The climax of all that training is a public performance. In this case, the first performance ever staged in front of Vienna's stunning Imperial Schönbrunn Palace. It begins with a simple warm-up. Remember, this is the oldest riding school in the world, developed more than 400 years ago and dedicated these days to preserving perfect classical dressage. Even their colour is strictly maintained. The uh, order to breed the Lipisanas only in white came in the uh, middle of the 18th century. You may know that the Lipisanas were bred strictly for the uh, needs of the Imperial Court in Vienna. Dr. Werner Pohl, who supervises the Spanish riding school, says that riders have to be exceptionally patient when training. If the horse doesn't like to do the lesson, you have no chance to get the goal today. So you have to be very disciplined as a rider and say, OK, I try tomorrow again. And then if the horse likes the lesson, it will do the lesson. And it will remember the lesson, and that's it. We like to have the best stallions here. This is one of our breeding tasks, to breed the best stallions for the performances of the Spanish Riding School. And we also need to know that uh, we need the best stallions going back for breeding in the breeding program in the National Stud in Piba. So we have a circle. The entrance to today's performance is grand in every way. After a last minute warm up behind the palace, the Lipizzanas are ridden straight through the heart of this magnificent Baroque masterpiece. It's a breathtaking entry. What follows in the specially built arena out front is a stunning display of classic formation riding. Leading the riders is Hans Riegler. This horse is called Siglavi Allegra. And it comes from because the father has the bloodline Siglavi, so he gets the name Siglavi. And the mother is called Allegra. Uh, this horse I'm training now since uh, 11 years. Being lead rider means he has to maintain a specific speed for the entire performance, keeping in time with the music. I can keep care to keep the speed uh, for 22 minutes because it's not so easy to lead the quadrille and to have 22 minutes and to finish by one or two seconds. Hans and his fellow riders are maintaining skills and traditions dating back to ancient Greece. Even their uniform, topped by its gold braided bicorn hat, is from the time of the Austrian Empire. For Hans, Riding like this involves special communication with the Lipizzanas. Classical dressage riding means that you, that you form the horse with your leg, with your weight, with your hand. With the natural reflex of the horse, we talk to him and we make the horse like a sport person. What distinguishes this form of riding from regular dressage are the next three classic steps. The Levard. This is where the horse stands at 30 degrees for a few seconds. This is one of the most representative uh, figures which used the emperors in the former centuries. When the horse is coming up and the, and the emperor can present himself and look over the other people. Then there's the corbet. Here, the horse again rears with all its weight on its hind legs, as in the Levard, but then jumps forward several steps. And finally, 
There's the Capriole. The horse jumps up and when it is for only part of seconds nearly in the weight, it strikes with the hind legs and it has the feeling that the horse is flying. It is indeed a sensational sight. One that's taken these lipazanas eight years to perfect. And yet another example of how sensitive and dedicated these stallions are.